Hello friends, this is Dale and I'm happy to share with you today this message on restoration. And uh, this is Universal Restoration. It's definitely uh, a unique message. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about it. Um, I have uh, studied this message for almost 30 years since I've become a Christian back in 1983 and 84. And actually it was a little later than that when I found out about this message. Uh, maybe 1985 or somewhere around there. And I didn't fully embrace it at that time, even for many years later. It's only a few months ago, actually, that I fully embraced this message because I really had to know that the Bible teaches it before I could fully embrace this message. And basically what this message is, in a nutshell, is that ultimately God will be able to reconcile all of His children back home. And that's what the Gospel is really all about, to bring us back to God so that God may be all in all, as in 1 Corinthians 15. That's the ultimate goal. And uh, unfortunately, most people can't see that at this time. But I want to share with you that it's a very healing message. It has really healed my soul and blessed me so much to understand and believe and uh, experience this message in my heart. Uh, for years now, I have believed that God is love. And I've even come to understand that God does not kill people, although He does allow killing to happen as He is the, the father and the parent of the universe. And therefore, whatever his children do, he takes responsibility. He even write, has the Hebrew prophets write that I did this, God did this, you know. Even in reality, when he's only allowing or permitting it to happen. And we see Jesus Christ is the ultimate revelation of God. And he revealed the compassionate, tender love of God for all humanity. We see how Jesus treated people, the poor, the sick, the crippled, and how he loves people and wants to make us whole body, soul, and spirit. Just make us healthy, whole, and well. Holy, healthy, happy. That's the goal of the uh, Christian life. And ultimately, when we are immortalized, of course, we're going to have that. But right now, this is a testing ground that we're in, in this age, in this world, in our lifetime. And so, God gives us special revelations to those who really want to know. And in my heart, I really want to know. Uh, there's a promise in uh, Jeremiah, and you shall seek me, and you shall find me, the Lord says when you shall search for me with all your heart. And uh, I have uh, really prayed earnestly to God for a deeper revelation of Him. And so He's revealed this to me. So I'm going to share with you some of the highlights of this message and so on. Um, <clears throat> yes, and so now that I know this beautiful message of God's character of love, and it does have a plan to reconcile all things to Himself in the ages to come, why should I teach this to somebody else? because usually we're rejected when we teach this message. But I want to share with you this uh, uh, teaching uh, in uh, Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 4. Excuse me while I uh, look this up here for you. 1 Timothy 4 verse um, t 9 through 11. It says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. This saying is faithful and it's worthy for everybody to accept it. Well, what is that? For therefore we both labor, we work hard, and we suffer reproach, that is, we're rejected, uh, because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Well, it took me a long time to believe it and embrace it and accept it, and now the Bible says these things command and teach. That's why I'm sharing this with you now. I have been commanded to, to teach this, that God is the Savior of all men, of all mankind, especially, especially of those that believe. And there's an order to this, a progression, progressive order, and you'll see that in 1 Corinthians 15, verses uh, 22 and on. A beautiful message of God's plan for the ages to come. Okay, verse, starting in verse uh, 22, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So Jesus has reversed the curse. Adam and all his descendants, including you and me, we, we die. And in Jesus Christ, the same all, we will all be made alive. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus has reversed the curse. And it goes on, But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ that is coming. So there's a, an order to this. Jesus is the first one raised from the dead. Then the saints who are ready to meet Jesus when he comes back to take us home. And, and then finally, the last group is um, 
Then the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must rule or reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. See how the order is? Christ the first fruits, those who are ready for Jesus when he comes a second time. And then the end, when he, everything is subdued to Jesus. When Jesus has put down all rule and authority, when all his enemies are under his feet. Okay. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Thank God. Because none of us likes death. For he has put all things under his feet. And when all things shall be subdued, brought into obedience to Jesus, then shall the Son also himself be sub subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. That's verse 28. That's the goal, friends. God will be all in all. That means he will be all things to all people. He will be everything to everybody. We will all worship him. No more idolatry. Isn't that wonderful? Praise God. Okay, I've got my notes here to keep me on track. There's three destinies of the wicked that are taught in the world today. Christian doctrine. The most popular is that God will uh, deal with the enemy, the wicked, and put them in a lake of fire and brimstone, and they will burn and suffer through the ceaseless ages of eternity in torment. And uh, they'll never come out of it. They'll never be saved. They'll always be alive, suffering in that, in that lake of fire and brimstone. Now, how does that look God, make God look like? Well... I think there's something better. Then the second uh, destiny of the wicked that is taught, mainly by Seventh-day Adventists, Jehovah's Witnesses, and a few others, is that the wicked will be burned up to ashes, literal ashes, and they will simply cease to exist. They'll be annihilated. Poof, gone forever. And the righteous who are left over will just have to get by without them. And that's... <clears throat> That's sad. It's better than the first, but it's, it's still a little sad, and, you know. Isn't there something better you could do? And so then we have the third, and that is the little-known uh, doctrine of restoration, universal restoration, that God will be able to reconcile all of his creatures back to himself in the ages to come. <clears throat> and, and, and I believe that doctrine glorifies God the best and puts a happy ending on it and... We'll talk more about how that works as we go on here. One thing we have to understand is the word forever and ever, eternal, eternity. Those words are translated from the Hebrew olam and from the Greek eon or ion, and the adjective is anonios. Those words mean a period of time. So a lot of people, translators translate them as age, uh, but for me, it's easiest just to say it's a period of time. For instance, uh, Jonah was in the belly of the well three days and three nights. He went. He uh, has a scripture, the earth with her bars was about me forever, in just a very short period of time. Uh, Paul sent Philemon, the slave, back in, and sa said that he would serve him forever, in other words, till he died. And so these words forever do not mean without end. Eternity, eternal, as used in the Bible, does not mean without end. The, the original word just means a period of time, an age or whatever. And the Bible talks about ages past, the present evil age, and then the ages to come. So that would be at least five ages if you look at it that way. And the, age, and the next age to come would be the 1,000 years. And then the age after that would be that period of time after the 1,000 years when the devil is loose for a little season. And uh, we have the sin against the Holy Ghost, which will not be forgiven in this age neither in the age to come. But after that is the final age in the restoration of all things. And I'll give you more uh, detail in that in just a moment. Okay, so after the 1,000 years, in the book of Revelation chapter 20, now before the 1,000 year millennium, we have the resurrection of all the righteous taken up to meet Jesus in the, in the air and will be with the Lord Jesus in heaven for 1,000 years. After that, we'll all come down with Jesus in the holy city of New Jerusalem back to this earth. And then Jesus will resurrect all the wicked dead who are the bad people who are left behind. The devil will deceive them and say, we can overcome the city. They will form a vast army and surround the holy city of New Jerusalem, preparing for a fierce conflict. When suddenly they see Jesus on his throne, and as the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked, they're conscious of all their sins. And that's the final judgment scene. It's like a panoramic view, a movie in the sky. The heavens will declare his righteousness. 
and they'll see the plan of salvation and they'll see the goodness of God and how God was working all through the ages to win people back from sin to righteousness and so that we can be a partaker of the heavenly home and so the wicked will feel so overwhelmed by this they will just um, yeah I just see a scripture here let me just uh, divert a little bit Nahum 1 9 Nahum is a tiny little book in the Old Testament chapter 1 verse 9 it says what do you imagine against the Lord he will make an utter end affliction will not rise up the second time what that tells us is that this affliction suffering sin problem will never rise up again once it's dealt with that's it God's kingdom will be eternally secure okay so we've talked about this heavens will declare his righteousness they see the plan of salvation they're overwhelmed with the the love and goodness of God and what do they do well okay let's look at some scripture support for this uh, Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 we'll start there I've got just a few texts I want to go over with you and I will say right now that there's hundreds of Bible texts that support this doctrine hundreds of them and in this little study I'm just going to share a handful okay <clears throat> Philippians chapter 2 verse uh, 10 that okay verse 9 through 11 Wherefore God also has highly exalted Jesus and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. What is this telling us, friends? The time is coming when every created being is going to bow down and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Wow! Awesome. Do you realize what that means? I just want to share a couple texts to support that. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 3. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Friends, this is telling us that the only way we confess Jesus Christ as Lord to the, is to by the Holy Spirit. So this is a genuine conversion experience. This is not forced and it's not faked. It is a genuine experience of confessing Jesus as Lord by the Holy Ghost. And I also want to share another supportive text to this in Romans chapter 10 verse uh, 9 and 10 that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you shall be saved for with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation you hear that friends if we confess Jesus with our mouth and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead we're saved that's it and that's what this text is telling us in Philippians chapter 2 and just to make sure you get the point God had this quoted in two other places in the Bible. Isn't that amazing? We find this in Romans chapter 14. Uh, I'm, give me a moment here to find it. Um, verse 11. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. There it is again. A Bible promise. And this is quoted uh, from Isaiah chapter 45. God is telling us in Old and New Testament this is his plan the plan of the ages Isaiah 45 verse 22 and 225 look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth for I am God and there's no one else I have sworn by myself God is swearing here the word has gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return that unto me every knee shall bow every tongue shall swear surely one will say in the Lord have I righteousness and strength to him shall men come and all that are incensed or angry against him shall be ashamed in the Lord shall all the seed of Israel be justified and shall glory in Romans 11 it says so all Israel shall be saved and so here we have it friends right out of the holy book the Bible itself God's great plan to rescue all humanity from sin and like I said there's many more um, second Timothy or I'm sorry second Peter chapter 3 verse 9 the Lord is not slack concerning his promises some men count slackness but is long-suffering very patient toward us 
not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So it's God's will to bring every human being, every created being, to repentance. Jesus says, I, and if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all unto me. All the angels, all mankind will be drawn to Jesus. Jesus says, um, I think it's John chapter 6, he says, No man can come unto me except the Father who has sent me draw him. Draw is drag, drag, draw him. And him that comes to me I will in no wise cast out. So it's all in the order of time. When the Father draws, they come to Jesus. He doesn't cast them out. And so that's how it works. And we can be thankful if we're drawn in this age because we're going to have the highest rewards. Those who serve Jesus now in this generation, in our lifetime, they will be exalted very high on God's throne and in the uh, positions in, in the heavenly government that God wants for us. Those who put it off and go through the lake of fire and brimstone experience, they will come in last. They will be our servants. And you'll find that in Isaiah chapter 14, verses uh, 1 and 2. Isn't that amazing? God is so fair and just and right and good. Isaiah 14, For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob and will yet choose Israel and set them in their own land, and the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Now these strangers are the people outside the city after the 1,000 years, when they bow down and confess. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place. We're going to bring them into the city when they're converted. And the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. And they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. So in general, the, the ruling class now, oppressing the people with rigorous laws and regulations, they will be the servants in the earth made new. And those who are meek in this lifetime, gentle like Jesus, we will be the rulers in the kingdom to come. It's going to be reversed, friends. So we have every incentive to put the Lord first now in this lifetime so that we will be in a very high position in God's government and kingdom. And uh, there's much more I can elaborate and say on that, but I'm going to keep this pretty concise so that I can fit it all in in a few minutes. And you're welcome to share with me your comments and questions and so on. Okay, I wanted to take a look also at Revelation chapter 5, verse 13. A beautiful text of Scripture, which is a promise to us. And I'm just letting you know that the whole Bible supports and teaches this. It's not, it's not just a one-verse theology. This is, this is a Bible doctrine. Uh, Rome, uh, Revelation 5, 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth, and such as are in the sea or oceans and all that are in them, Heard I say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sits upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, or Jesus, forever and ever. This is every created being. In heaven, earth, in the seas, every created being will be worshiping God and Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? Praise the Lord. That's the ultimate goal. That's what it's all leading toward, friends. Let me share a little bit more. Let's, okay, God has put Sodom and Gomorrah as an example in the Bible of how he's going to do this. Believe it or not. Sodom, rained upon with fire and brimstone from the Lord out of heaven and reduced to ashes. These people God has not forgotten about. Okay, I'm going to share a few texts with you on this. Uh, 2 Peter 2 verse 6 tells us, um, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example to those that after should live ungodly. Uh, a fiery destruction, burning them to literal ashes. And then we have Jude, verse uh, 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are get, set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Well, we know they're not burning today. So that word eternal is that word for a period of time. And that fire probably came down in an hour, two hours, six hours. It could have been 12 hours. It's probably a day or less. The fire came down and burned them up, and they were reduced to ashes. Okay, so that, again, that word, eternal, forever and ever, just means a period of time. It could be a short period of time or a long period of time. Another example of that. Okay, but the most power, okay, and then let me share it with you a little bit longer. Now, this is very powerful, so hold on. You're going to be amazed by this. Uh, Matthew chapter 11, uh, Jesus talked about Sodom, and uh, he says, Thou Capernaum, which are exalted to heaven, this is a city that Jesus did many mighty miracles in, in healing the sick. 
He says, You will be brought down to hell, that means the grave, for if the mighty works which had been done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. You realize what that means? If Jesus had come back in the days of Sodom and performed his miracles in that city, that city would have repented sufficiently that it would still be there in that day when Jesus was here, you know, when he came into the world. Amazing. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. You know what that tells me? In the day of judgment, the Sodomites are going to repent before the people in Capernaum. Because the people in Capernaum rejected more light. They said no to Jesus. But Sodom didn't have as much light and they will repent sooner. Wow, that's amazing. Now, here's the big one. This is the one that I've re this is the one that really turned my heart toward universal restoration. I thought, wow, if God can save the Sodomites, he can save anybody, right? So let's check it out. Right in the Bible in black and white. Ezekiel chapter uh, 16. Excuse me while I get this. Ezekiel 16. We're going to start here in, uh, let's see, the verse, of, I think it's 40 something. Uh, 44. That's right. <clears throat> Okay, I'm just going to read a little bit here. Behold, okay, starting at verse 46. Your elder sister is Samaria, she and her daughters that dwell at your left hand, and your younger sister that dwells at your right hand is Sodom and her daughters. So Ezekiel is giving a prophecy to Jerusalem. And he's saying that Samaria is your daughter on the left hand, and Sodom is your daughter on the right hand. Now, Sodom had already been burned up years ago, back in Abraham's day. But Ezekiel is presenting a prophecy to Jerusalem and comparing Jerusalem with Samaria and uh, Sodom. So he goes on here. Uh, Yet have you not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations? But if that were a very little thing, you have you were corrupted more than they in all their ways. As I live, says the Lord God, Sodom, your sister, has not done she nor her daughters as you have done, you and your daughters. What God is saying to Jerusalem is, your sins, my God's professed people, the Jews, the Christian Jews, so to speak, uh, are worse sinners than the Sodomites and the Samaritans. Isn't that shocking? Wow, this is a wake-up call. So he goes on, um, This was the iniquity of Sodom, your sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, idleness, and they did not strengthen the hand of the poor and needy, and they were proud and committed abomination, therefore I took them away as I saw good. So God allowed them to be destroyed. Okay. Neither has Samaria committed half of your sins, but you have multiplied your abominations more than they. You have justified your sisters in all your abominations. Wow. God says Jerusalem is making Sodom and Samaria look good compared to their sins. Woo. God is saying, bear your own shame. You have committed more abominable sins than they have. They are more righteous than you are. You have justified your sisters. Wow, that is so shocking that Jerusalem's sins are so much worse than, than Sodom's sins and Samaria's sins. Now, here we are in verse 53, Ezekiel 16, verse 53. When I shall bring again their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, and the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, then I will bring again the captivity of your captives in the midst of them. So God is going to bring back the captivity of Sodom and Samaria and Jerusalem. When your sisters, Sodom and her daughters, shall return to their former estate, and Samaria and her daughters shall return to their former estate, then you and your daughters shall return to your former estate. They're all going to be restored. Samaria, Sodom, and Jerusalem, they're all going to be restored to their former estate. That's a resurrection that's uh, made alive again. They're going to be returned and restored. Okay, now we're going to go to verse 61. Then you shall remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters, your elder and your younger, for I will give them unto you for daughters, and I will establish my covenant with you, and you will remember and be confused and never open your mouth any more because of your shame when I am pacified toward you for all that you have done, saith the Lord God. That to me is amazing, friends. God's gifts are irrevocable. His calling will not be changed. I mean, God chose the Jew first as an example, and the Gentiles follow. 
So God is going to give Jeru He's going to restore Jerusalem. He's going to restore Sodom and Samaria and give them to Jerusalem as daughters. Isn't that a fantastic prophecy? That is truly wonderful. God is so good. And we need to know that. We need to know that we serve a wonderful God. And we are now in this world as in the valley of the shadow of death, but soon this will pass away and we're going to be in, uh, in an earth made new and we're going to be immortalized, our bodies, and we're going to be happy and healthy and holy and, and we're just going to be praising the Lord and uh, rejoicing in God's goodness. And uh, He really is a good God. Uh, right now, it's difficult to see all this because, well, I'll just read it to you. It's in Isaiah 25. It says that there is a veil, like a heavy curtain spread over the nations. And what this means is that we cannot see the truth very easily because of this veil. And I'll tell you what the veil is in just a moment. Isaiah chapter 25, starting in verse 6 and 7 here. And in this mountain shall the Lord of hosts make unto all people a feast of fat things, a feast of wines on the leaves, of fat things full of Maryland. What God is saying is He's going to make a big dinner for everybody. This is going to be the table of the Lord, table of the Lord for everybody. And He will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people and the veil that is spread over all nations. You know what this covering is, this veil, this shroud? It's lies. It's the devil's lies about God. That's why we can't see this beautiful truth about our loving Heavenly Father and His wonderful Son, Jesus Christ. It's because of this veil, this curtain that is spread over the nations. It's lies. All the errors and deceptions and lies that the devil has told about God, he's deceived the whole world. And that's why it's so hard for us to see through the fog to see our wonderful, loving Heavenly Father. But the time is coming when God will destroy that veil, that covering. How is He going to do that? He's going to turn the lights on. When God turns the lights on, the darkness is gone. The lies will be gone. The covering, the veil will be gone. And we'll be able to see God face to face. See Him as the wonderful, kind, loving, humble, forgiving person that He is. And it's going to warm our hearts. He's going to convert us. We're going to all be reconciled. And uh, He will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of His people shall He take away from off all the earth, for the Lord has spoken it. And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. And we have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. Friends, this is what it's all about. The message of the Gospel is about God and His love for us and His salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, showing us the way back to the Father's home. Into the Father's heart. Into the Father's heart is love, compassion, humility, forgiveness, kindness. Think of the the most wonderful friend that you have on this earth. That's a shadow, a, a tiny taste of the wonderful friendship of God. And He wants to befriend you. He wants you to love Him, honor Him, talk to Him. As I'm talking to you, you can talk to God. You can say, God, I'm here. Uh, I need your help. I love, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to praise you and love you the best I know, and I need your help. And I need your help now, today. I, need, I might need a job. I might need food. I might need money. I might need a spouse. I need, I need the presence of God in my life and every else, everything else that's needed will come. If we have God in our life, then that's the, the foundation, the most important thing. And we build on the foundation. Everything else that's needed will be added. And so I encourage you today to make God your strength, your refuge, your hope, your salvation, your friend. God wants to be that to you because He loves you so much. And He proved it by allowing us to turn His beloved Son, Jesus Christ, into a human sacrifice. Yes, God says, I'm going to let you do what you want to with me. I'm your gift. I have come to be a gift to you. I will heal your sick. I will raise your dead. I will heal your diseases. I will forgive you and love you. And if, all, and if you want to turn me into a human sacrifice and kill me, I will let you do that. But I still love you. That's the message of Jesus and the cross. That's the power of the blood. That God is harmless. Hebrews 7 verse 26. Holy, harmless, and undefiled. That's Jesus, our high priest. He didn't strike back. He didn't say, get away from me, you filthy sinners. I'm going to roast you in the fire. No. Jesus says, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. 
And Jesus knows he's going to get them all back. He's going to win them all back. If not in this age, then in the ages to come, he will get them all back. Because Isaiah 53, Christ shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. That's his labor, his hard work. He will see of the travail, the hard labor of his soul and shall be satisfied. Isaiah 53. When Jesus gets his children back, he will finally be satisfied. The shepherd will not come back until he has rescued that one lost sheep. He will search in the wilderness until he finds that sheep and brings it back home. The prodigal son. Lucifer was the first prodigal son to leave his father's house and go out into a far country and spend his goods on riotous living. But the day will come. He might be in a pig pen wanting to eat the, the husk of the pigs, but the time will come when he will come to a senses and realize it's much better off in my father's house than out here. And uh, he will come back. It'll take a period of time. Revelation 20 says he will be, Satan will be loosed a little season. Uh, Moses uh, chose to uh, live for God for a season, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's in the book of Hebrews. And so a season is about a lifetime. Now Isaiah 65 tells us a prophecy about how long this might last. According to Isaiah 65, it might take about a hundred years for the last sinner to come home after the 1,000 years when they're surrounding the city. Isaiah 65, uh, talking here, uh, verse 17 and on. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Now this is a wonderful prophecy of the earth made new. Be glad and rejoice, and that I will create. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem. There will be no more an infant of days, nor an old man that is not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. And he shall build houses and inhabit them, and he shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them. This is a prophecy the earth made new, friends. If there's a sinner there a hundred years old, or during a, up to a hundred years later, it will be accounted a curse. The last sinner will finally come home. It's a dead end. Jesus says, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob will be in the kingdom and you yourselves thrust out. That was the religious teachers in his day. They'll be out there in the dark. And out there in the dark, it's a dead end. They're going to get tired of that. They might be there a hundred years. They might be, you know, scavenging, uh, surviving the best they can. But eventually they're going to get tired of that. They're going to, one by one, they're going to say, I'm going to go back to my father's house, the prodigal son. It's better for me there. And not only that, but the saints inside the city... They're going to miss their grandpa and grandma. They're going to miss their son or daughter. They're going to miss their wife or their, their husband. They're going to miss their friends and, and relatives. They're going to be willing to go outside the city, out there where the mean and the abominable and the whoremonger and all the wicked are, and they're going to find them one by one and say, Look, look what God has done for me. I've been immortalized. I'm happy. You can have this too. Come with me. Come on in. The person might say, Yeah, but I feel so sinful. It's okay. Jesus will love you and forgive you. Come on in. And one by one, they will start coming. They will get converted. No man can come into that city with sin. They have to wash their robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. Blessed are they that do His commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life, and may enter in through the gates into the city. That's Revelation, I think, 22, 21 or 22. And so, eventually, every last sinner will come to Jesus and be saved. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't that a beautiful message? That gives me comfort. The people that I love so much that were outside of Christ when they died, they will be brought back. They won't receive the reward that we can have if we're saved in this life, but they still will be brought back. Now, we have another text that confirms that, and, uh, and we can go on and on. I'm going to wrap this up, though. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, listen to this, starting in verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a foundation. He is our Savior. And it, Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, these are rewards that we will receive when Jesus comes. If we lay up treasure in heaven, we will get those rewards. Uh, wood, hay, stubble, those are combustible. They will not, they will not be rewarded. Uh, every man's work shall be made manifest or revealed, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide or continue which he has built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, 
he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. You get that, friends? If in this lifetime we build upon the foundation, Jesus Christ, gold, silver, precious stones, we're going to get a reward for that, and we're going to have a high position in God's kingdom, and we're going to be very happy. But if in this lifetime we, we don't lay up treasure in heaven, we don't serve the Lord, we build, we, we, we build a foundation of wood, hay, and stubble, that's earthly treasure, it's all going to be burned up in the fire. The fire will try every man's work of what sort it is, and, no, and wood, hay, and stubble burns when you put it in the fire. No reward. No reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. A lifetime of work that is lost. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. You see that, friends? We all have to go through the fire. Jesus will baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor. He's going to clean everybody, purge everybody. And we're all going to be baptized with fire. And God's fire is not literal, burning to literal ashes. Oh, no. There is the God of this world, Satan the devil, that uses literal fire to burn up Job's sheep and oxen and, and cattle and servants. Uh, Satan uses literal fire to destroy and burn up. But God's fire is very different. God's fire is spiritual. For our God is a consuming fire. The true God, His fire is a harmless fire of love. And that's proved many places. Moses saw a bush burning. And out there in the desert when he was wandering for 40 years. He went to see this bush that was on fire, but it didn't burn up. That's God's presence. Uh, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost, the Spirit, came down upon the heads of the apostles. Flames of fire came upon them. They didn't burn up. Their hair didn't get singed. This holy fire is God's presence. It's the Spirit. It's harmless. It's love. God is love. His Spirit is love. And it's, and it's called a fire. It's a pure and holy fire. So when it tells us here in Revelation chapter 20, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured the wicked and the devil, this holy fire from God is the pure love of God's coming down upon them. And it's pictured as a fire because it brings to repentance. And sometimes it brings some emotional pain as they let go of that guilt. Um, let me just share with you a little bit of background on this so that you can understand it better. Okay, there's so many references to this. I'm, I'm just trying to um, put this together here. In the book of Jude, we have a reference to this. Uh, and of some have compassion, making a difference. And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. So we present the love of God, the salvation of Christ. And if they, and if they receive the love of God and, are, and come into Christ and are saved, wonderful. But if we have to share with them... The destruction that will happen if they don't come to Jesus. The devil has legal rights to them to hurt them and destroy them. And if they come through fear, then that's okay also. Others say with fear, pulling them out of the fire. See? And so again, this is not a, a literal fire, but it's a spiritual fire. And we see this all through the Bible, how God's love is a fire. And uh, Song of Solomon 8, verse 6 says that God's fire is love. His, lo his, uh, his love is like a fire. Okay, and there's so much more I can share with you on that, but I think you get the point, hopefully. And so, the fire, the lake of fire and brimstone is, the lake is a body of waters, and Revelation 17 says that the waters which you saw represent people, multitudes, nations, and languages. So this lake of fire, this lake is uh, all these people, and a fire is God's spirit coming upon them, and the brimstone is like soap, like fuller's soap. We get this in Malachi chapter 3. I mean, this is just so good. Malachi chapter 3, the messenger of the covenant, Christ when he comes to his temple. He who may abide the day of his coming, who shall stand when he appears. He is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. There's your fire and brimstone. And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. There we go. He's going to purify the people. And that's what we need. And so the, the sooner we come into His fire and get purified, the better. The more rewards we can have. And so I encourage you to do that. Okay. And one other thing I'm going to cover. I, I'm going to have to close this, but death. We have, the, we have the first death and the second death. 
Okay, we can see this uh, taught in uh, John chapter 3, uh, Jesus talking to Nicodemus. He says, you must be born again. Nicodemus says, do I need to go back into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, no. Uh, Jesus says, you must be born of the Spirit. There's a, there's a physical birth and there's a spiritual birth. There's a physical death and there's a spiritual death. You must be born again. You must die to sin, die to selfishness, die to worldly, the, the lust of the world. Okay, we see this uh, also. There's, there's a, a, spirit, a physical birth, a spiritual birth, a physical death, and a spiritual death. Okay, we all have to die spiritually. If we're going to be in God's kingdom, we all have to die spiritually. And we see this in Romans chapter uh, 6. Let me share this with you. Okay. <clears throat> I like that text that says, Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. Don't you love it? Sin is not greater than God. Oh, no. Where sin abounded, grace much more abounds. God's love is greater than sin. Okay, Romans 6. Um, what shall we say? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? You see, we have to die to sin. Um, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with Jesus, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is free from sin. And it goes on, it has a whole chapter about this. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we, as Christians, we die the second death. We die to sin. We, that's why in Revelation it tells us that, that God's people don't have to suffer the second death because we've already died to sin. We've already experienced that conversion. But the wicked on the outside of the city, they have yet to get converted, and that's why they have to die the second death. The second death is a spiritual death to sin. That's right. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's dying to sin and selfishness. It's dying to worldly ambition, dying to pride, dying to lustful passion. Whatever it is that separates us from God has to die. And so that's what the second death is. It's a spiritual death. And then we'll be reborn again. And, Jesus said, and God says, And behold, I make all things new. He that is in Christ is a new creation, a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That's the message of the Bible. That's the gospel. That's the love of God. That's what we need to know, friends. And I hope that you really got this message and, and, it, and it just sinks in. And I'll tell you, I only touched a few scriptures. This Bible is full of texts that support and teach the doctrine of universal restoration. And so I encourage you to study it out for yourself. And, and there's a lot of books about it. Go online on the internet, a lot of information available about it. And uh, this is considered... Uh, I just want to share that with you. God bless you, friends. Thank you. Um, take care.